Welcome to the first official episode of the Divorce Dad Playbook Podcast. I'm Dan Levy. And I'm Scott Levy. And we are... One dad who's down to earth and one dad with his head in the clouds. I, I think we're father of the year. You can count on This is from My Two Dads, no which do, is amazing because in 2020, me. My Two Dads no would probably not be brothers no like we are. It'd be two gay men who have a child. But back in the 80s or 90s, whenever that Paul Reiser show came out, it was two men who had both dated the same woman at the same time, and the paternity was indeterminate. So these two guys, it was essentially the odd couple with a child, and they both had to raise, raise this daughter as their own. This show's a little different than that, right? This is not exactly going to be, we're odd couple, but not exactly the same style. This show will be very different than that. But it, but it's nice music to start with. So let's, before we, we get going into our first topic, which today is going to be a pretty broad topic of communication. Uh, I actually had some personal issues this week that I wanted to bounce off you anyway. So I figured let's record it and just see what everybody else thinks as well. But why don't we, why don't we start with what is this Divorce Dad Playbook project that we are doing? Where did this come from? And who the heck other than you would have ever come up with an idea like this? <laughs> So it's, it's great to start this, uh, you know, finally, it's been a long time in the works, obviously. And, and really, um, this started because I, I was separated and divorced eight years ago. And when I went through my separation and divorce, uh, I was really the first one of all my friends, my, my, my group, you know, whatever it may be. And I had no one to go to, nobody to help me, and and really nobody to help me answer a lot of questions that I had that I just had to learn on my own, and I made a lot of mistakes. And ultimately, as time you know moved on, uh, a lot of additional friends of mine uh, were getting divorced. They were coming to me for help and and asking me different questions. I feel like I had done a ton of research and made the mistakes that I didn't want them to make. And fast forwarding. Ultimately, when you started to go through your, you know, your events, uh, I, I realized, well, wait a second, here I go again for the hundredth time of helping someone, now somebody who's even closer to me and near and dear to my heart, that I just felt like this is a great opportunity to get all this knowledge that I have, all these experiences that I have, and all the contacts and connections that I have to provide even better content than I can provide to yeah. you and to all those people out there that are going through the same kind of thing. So what's interesting, and I've been telling people this recently when, when I talk about this topic uh, or that we're doing the show, is you've been divorced eight years. I've ostensibly been divorced eight months. And so it's kind of interesting and it is definitely an odd couple situation because we are in very different places. And you seem to remind me of that all the time that we are in very different places, which is I guess in a way comforting, but also in a way just kind of demeaning and, and condescending. Um, so it, it, it's an interesting dynamic that I think we're going to have throughout the show. Um, for people who don't necessarily know my story, I was in media for a really long time. I got completely disenfranchised with the world as it is, and specifically the world of media. And I fell into a hole, a pretty deep hole. And with therapy, with medication, with help from friends and family, it took me a very long time to get out of that hole and I didn't think I was ever gonna get out of it. Um, and the collateral damage was thrust upon my wife, which I horrifyingly didn't realize how much damage I was doing to her, to her because I was doing all that damage to myself. Um, and that's what led to our divorce. I, I, I think just a lesson for everyone out there, if you say to your wife over and over again that you're not good enough for her, eventually she's going to believe you. And, <laughs> And that's a concern if you want to stay married. If you don't, and you're like, you know, this is reaching its end. I was not that. So, so I was kind of, I think both of us, we can say we're, we're kind of just um, maybe not surprised in retrospect when we got divorced, when you look back at the relationship, but certainly at the time, it was neither of our decisions as to how this, this sort of came about for both of us. Yeah. And, and, and I think that hopefully everyone who's listening, you know, they all have their unique situations and some of them may have been on the side where we were, which was potentially a little bit of surprise. Again, retrospect, not surprising. Uh, and other people will have caused it. Either way, you know, no matter where you are on, on either end of the spectrum or somewhere in between, uh, you're, you're, you're either 
about to head into a lot of stuff that you're not prepared for, um, or you're in the middle of it, or, or you just need some guidance as to how you can get, you know, a little bit further along. And, and the key thing about this is um, why we've called this the divorced dad playbook is because, you know, as people will learn about us, I mean, I'm the dad. Yeah, of, take it, moms. Of, Sorry. Right. And we love moms and we think moms are amazing and empowered. And I've learned a lot from our mom, which is, you know, a whole different part we of it. We love Don't moms. Even, right. We, we love moms, certainly our own mom. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm the dad of two of two kids. And, and so being a single guy uh, is very different than being a, a single dad. And, and, and that will be a big part of the of the playbook and and the guidance that people will need the guidance that I needed was how do I manage my life how do I manage my life you know with work and how do I manage my kids and making sure that that they don't get adversely affected by all the stuff that happened to me that I still want them to have as normal of a life as possible I think that that's really like so, the crux behind this you mentioned you have kids your two kids are in high school uh, my two kids are um, both graduating into their next school uh, this year. I have one in fifth and one in eighth. Um, so I, I am getting up to a similar point uh, in, in my kids' lives that you have gone through during this whole divorce process. So we are about at the same spot in comparison to our children, I think, as you were right. you know, when you got divorced. So, so, so there is, there is a, a helpful part of it. I will say this just for... Um, the purposes of reaching out and we'll say this a million times. Um, but if you want to reach out to Scott, uh, and, and pick his brain or contribute, or you think you have something to add to either the show or the site, he's at Scott at divorcedadplaybook.com. If you want to tell me how stupid I am or tell me something funny. And later on, I actually will need all of your help. I'm at Dan at divorcedadplaybook.com. Uh, so that's the best way to reach us. Um, for now we're going to have all sorts of social stuff, but, but to get to us directly, I think that's, really what we're looking for with this, right? We want to touch people directly. We want it to be through the site and certainly through the community that we're building, but I'm always going to be accessible. I'm always going to be able to email back or hit me up on Instagram on direct message or whatever you want to do. But that's sort of, I would say, Scott, that's sort of like why you are building it out the way that, that we are, that we don't, I used to say this when I had my radio show on Sirius, that, um, I, I never would say to my audience, cause they're all over the country, like this is going to be, and I, I never wanted to say to my audience, we'll talk to you tomorrow. It's a very simple, subtle thing, but I always said, we'll talk with you tomorrow. Right. And I brought that up to somebody who was in radio recently and they're like, that's a really interesting point that no, most people don't think of. But to me, it's really important. We're not talking yeah. to the people who are listening to this. We wanna talk with you. Yeah. And, and that even means be on the show. If you wanna come in, we're doing this on Zoom. It's very easy to add people to the show. If you have something that you think you can contribute, if you wanna tell us how dumb we are, we would love that because I'm sure we're going to be ripping on each other much more than we are now. We're very polite at the beginning of this episode. <laughs> well, well, I, I think ultimately as people see this, um, I hope people do come on the show and we do want to talk with them. As, as you said, I would imagine the Dan at divorcedadplaybook.com will get a lot more action than Scott at divorcedadplaybook.com simply because you are, you are a shiny example of what I've been through and what many people are going through right now. And, and, and it's entertaining and it's a, it's a little, uh, it's funny, um, but it's serious at the same time. And, right. and we'll have great banter with this because I, I do think most of the time you're an idiot. I just like the fact that we're about five minutes into the first episode and you already admitted that Dan is getting more action than Scott because it's completely true. I am at the point in, <laughs> in my divorce, which we'll get to in a bit because we'll tease this at the end. We have some fun with, with different dating apps and whatnot. Um, but there is something I want to ask you about, and, and we'll throw this out there now. Um, we will ask you later, and I will certainly share my worst ghosted story. So let's look for that later, because I have one that I used to have one that I thought was really bad. I got ghosted hard by someone, but this is the worst I've ever had. And we'll get to that later. But first, as we talk about the two of us communicating on this show, um, let, let's, if we can, talk about communication in general. And, and what I mean in terms of between you and your ex, now you've been divorced for much longer than I have. And so you've kind of, I would imagine, fallen into a pattern, whether it's good or bad. And I think a lot of people out there who have uh, gone through this divorce are dealing with the same thing, whether it's good or bad, you've fallen into that sort of pattern of how you communicate with your ex. I feel like I'm still trying to figure that out. And there are times because I, I honestly, I 
take fault. I didn't do it on purpose, but I feel like this divorce was my fault. And so for a long time at the beginning, I was very conscious of not pushing back. I didn't want to be any more disagreeable than I was as a husband. I didn't want to be any more pain or suffering than I felt I, I had put on my family. But now, you know, almost a year from the time we were uh, first separated, screw it. I have thoughts and feelings and I feel like I should be a part of stuff. So I'm starting to push back more now and it hasn't really worked my way. And I, I need to figure out a way to communicate better, but still get my needs met. I, I can't be aggressive because it just doesn't work. It didn't work married and it certainly doesn't work divorced. And so now I'm right. trying to figure out how to get my needs met. How have you over the years sort of changed your communication style with your ex? Yeah. I, I mean, look, I think communication is certainly one of the pillars of any kind of relationship, you know, whether you're together or apart. Uh, I think everyone, you know, that we're talking with, uh, if, if your communication was awesome, you'd probably still be married or not going through a separation. <laughs> Uh, that being Fair. said, and, and, and I probably am the same, uh, that being said, you know, shit happens and, and we are where we are and the communication becomes so much more critical after the fact. So as what you're going through and what I've been through and still go through, it's not always so easy, but what I've learned is, especially when you're sharing a child or children, you have to be over communicative. You have to like, when you, when it doesn't matter if you're pissed at the other person or you feel ashamed or you know, you're embarrassed, whatever it may be, the reality is the relationship you have with your ex will always be better if you are communicative. And, and, and that's, I, I, I'll say that over and over again. And I think you need to find your footing, like what you're going through is that you had your relationship the way that it was when you were married and the communication clearly wasn't working. You were a bit of a prick or whatever it may be. Um, you know, I'll so, right. And, 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 and you know that you can't do that now, but the reality is you're not together anymore. You got to remember that, like you're not together. And hopefully most of the people that are, you know, with us here are not trying to listen to this to see that there's a magical way that you're going to get back together with your ex. Right. You're not. And, and, but you are together for specific reasons and you're together largely for your children. And, and as you go through this process with your kids, making sure that your kids can have as normal of a life as possible, the idea is you will be better and you need to be better at communicating with your ex for the kids. And, and sometimes you just got to remember that. Sometimes you really just got to remember the fact that you need to uh, not judge you need to not make assumptions. You need to not have hate in your in your tone, whether it's through text or you know on the phone, whatever it may be. Uh, right. You just need to kind of like put the past behind you and focus on the future or the present and the future, and focus on the best communication style with your ex for the benefit of you being you know not so stressed and well, your kids having a good life. Look, I'm going to say this, I, and I agreed with you up until you said you have to worry about the future. You do have to worry about the future, but the future is never guaranteed. Clearly, look at what's going on in the world. The future is never guaranteed. So I, I am really trying to, and this is a mindfulness practice that I've learned over the last two or three years in therapy. I'm worrying about now. I'm worrying about the present. I, I'm not saying that I don't have an eye on the future. I'm not saying that I don't have goals and plans both for myself uh, personally, professionally, and also within my relationship, within my family. But I'm not worried about that because I need to worry about now and I need to worry about figuring this out. And, and, and I say this, and again, like this show is gonna get as real as we want it to. And, and spoiler alert, you're gonna learn a lot more about me than you probably ever wanted to. Um, I am as open a book as possible. And the reason I'm doing this is because I wasn't for a long time. And you told me this last week, like I didn't tell anybody anything. And I looked at all of you like, what the hell? How did you not see this happening? And you're like, you're always like that. You're always just a dick. Well, no one knew that I was dealing with several mental illness issues and needed help. And I knew I needed help, but I didn't want to be medicated because I thought that was going to ruin my creativity. It was going to change my, my outlook on things. And now I know, yeah, it would have, and it probably would have been for the better. Right. 
And so I right. need to worry about now because I can't tell you how many days I would either wake up or go to sleep, not knowing if there was going to be a not now. Now is all that, I, now that all exists because what if there's nothing after now? Right. Um, to spin that in a more positive way, I, I said before that I, I'm try, starting to push back a little bit because sometimes you do make mistakes and sometimes, you know, I don't necessarily feel that history shouldn't be sitting on your shoulders, right? You shouldn't have 17 years of marriage or however long you've been together on every single mistake you made. And I felt like that happened this week. We, uh, the first, last week was the first week that the kids were going to school. They go a couple days, they stay home three days, whatever. And I was tasked with picking up the kids after school. I had gotten a bunch of emails, but you know how many emails these schools have been sending. It's confusing. Yeah. And, and information's changing. So earlier in the day, I just double checked. What time do I have to pick up the kids? Zoe was at 1259. I looked on the website. Max on the website for his school said 140. So Zoe and I stopped at the store in between going to pick up Max. Well, it turns out Max gets out at 120. The website wasn't updated. I got a call from him at 125 and I said, are you all right? He's like, yeah, I'm just going to walk home. We live, the house is a mile from the school. All right, dude, great. We'll catch up to you. He sounded like such a confident kid. He's walked to school half the year last year. He, he knows how to do it. He knows the way to go. We thought nothing of it. I get a text from my ex. Did you forget Max? He's very upset. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He didn't seem very upset to me. And I didn't write her back because I'm driving. Then I call Max. He's got a watch that's got a phone on it. Right. Can't get in touch with him. Call him again. Can't get in touch with him. Zoe calls. Can't get in touch with him. This is now between five and 10 minutes. We are driving around the neighborhood looking for a 10-year-old kid who's walking home from school. All of the paths that he would have gone, can't find him. So now I'm getting very upset because where the hell is Max? Finally, we get through to him and it turns out he called my ex because he was upset that I left him or forgot him. And she decided to stay on the phone with him the entire walk home to make him feel better. His phone was busy. He doesn't have call waiting on his watch phone. Right. And I couldn't get in touch with him, Scott, because he was talking to my ex the entire time. And so I texted her and I'm like, did you not think that I might've been trying to communicate with him? And she said, you forgot the kid at school and you're mad at me. I said, I did not forget him. I, I misread an email or I saw something. I was in contact with him within three minutes and said, stay where you are, we'll come pick you up. He said, no, I'll walk. Cool, you go walk kid. And yet somehow that story got spun into, I'm a negligent father. I forgot my kid at school. And to, she took no responsibility for the fact that the reason I couldn't get in touch with him is because she was on the phone with him. Or had I just called him, I would have said, dude, we're in the neighborhood. Where are you? I would have gone and picked him up. We would have saved 10 minutes. It wouldn't even have been an issue at all. Right. But so now, so now because of all those things, it was one event that, that in, in, a, in a lifetime full of many events, it will be way worse than that. Uh, you know, this is dominating your today. And, and it's frustrating and the communication broke down during that. And look, at, and, and that's what I'm saying is that that's gonna happen, right? Like she, she was not calling you a delinquent dad. She was, she was taking a shot because you, there was a shot to be taken. And unfortunately, when you're early on in, in your you know, divorce, you know, there's still feelings of resentment. There's still feelings of some hatred and, and whatever it may be. And you know what? Both sides, it happens. Like both sides take shots when you get them. And I'm not saying that's right. Sometimes it just is what it is. I'm not encouraging everyone who's, you know, participating and listening to this to take shots at your ex. But you need to be able to take, you need to be able to take the shots and, and be like, okay, you know, um, Although I know I didn't do something so wrong, I can understand that she views it differently. And sometimes you just gotta let it go. And 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 that's really what it is. And and look, it took me it took me a lot of years to yeah. not get triggered. And that's a big word of getting triggered, to not get triggered by 
you know, my ex and some of the things that she would do. Cause I felt like, you know, why would you do that? Why would you bring this up in front of the kids? Like why, like, I can't stand that stuff when there's stuff that we can talk about together. And yet it's an open conversation in front of the kids because it puts the kids in a tough spot. It puts the kids in, a, in an awkward position. I want to protect my kids at the end of the day. And I think, a, go ahead. and all I'll say is I, and I, and I think um, in the, what you were just describing is, although she maybe made you feel bad and you had the best of intentions, the good news about it all from my perspective is that you both were trying to do the right thing for your son. And I think at the end of the day, you've got to remember that part. And hopefully everyone who is you know, a part of this you know, podcast and the playbook that we're doing will always keep that in mind because that is something that I believe in wholeheartedly. Anyone who knows me knows that I do everything and anything I can to make sure that my kids are okay and that they're safe and that they're taken care of. If you have that in mind, you're an adult. They're the kids, like two adults and one of the adults didn't agree with the other adult. That's fine. She's taking some pop shots at you that you got to be a man and just kind of deal with that. But at the end of the day, Max was fine and you worked it out and then you got to kind of move on. All right. So here's another one that's not necessarily a, a blame situation, but it is definitely a communication issue. And it somewhat pertains to the topics going on in the world. Um, you know that you're uh, my kids, I was going to say your niece and nephew, but that's a whole other conversation for another day. Um, they are very uh, in tune with the world. For a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old, they are woke. Let's put it that way. I mean, there's not really a better word in this day and age to say that. Um, uh, Zoe is at the forefront of the LGBTQA+, I got all of those, I believe, um, sort of world that, that uh, has engulfed her. And Max really cares about social justice very much. And we have talked about this and he absorbs information well beyond what a 10 year old is, should be capable of absorbing and, and craves that information. And so a few weeks ago before school started, I did not bring this up. They came to me because we watch a lot of NBA and we watch a lot of NFL. And both of them said, uh, what would you think if I told you that when we go back to school, I don't want to stand for the national anthem. And I said, I don't understand why they do the national anthem in school. It's kind of weird anyway, but I don't want you to just sit because you think that's what you should do. If you have a legitimate reason that you feel that you do not identify with that song or prayer or whatever the heck you want to call it, because it's really a prayer about the country, then I am okay with that. I'm not telling you to sit. I don't know what I would do, frankly, but if you feel that strongly, and of course, Zoe, I feel that strongly. And Max said, I feel that strongly too. And I said, okay, but don't just do it because it's something that you saw on TV. Don't just do it because it's something you think that's what progressive people will do. Flash forward, this was a few weeks before school started. Flash forward to the day that school began and I was told in the car that they had that same conversation with their mom and she told them flat out, no, they have to stand for the national anthem. And look, for people who know our family, she's more progressive than me probably. She's not you know, on the different side of the aisle from me, but clearly she's got different thoughts on that. Uh, we have cops in our family. We have military in our family. I don't know if it had to do with that or not, but that's a conversation that I thought the two of us should have had. I said to them, I'm okay with it, but you have to have a reason, but you should talk to your mom. I didn't mention that part before. I definitely said, talk to mom about this. And maybe that's a discussion we all have. They talked to mom about it and she made the decision without even coming to me at all. She has yet to even tell me that she had that conversation with the kids. And so what do I do in a situation like that? <laughs> well, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, Look, sometimes you're just not going to agree, and you're not going to communicate, and and I think that that's you know part of the deal. I think I think the lesson can be that you know when when they came to you and and you said talk to your talk to your mom again. Keep in mind that they're kids and they're still rather young kids. You probably should have called your ex and said, by the way, they're going to talk about this. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. This happens a lot. Like what I do a lot with my ex is I'll I'll talk to the kids about something. And even though I say to them, you need to talk to your mom because I want them to have that relationship with their mom, just like they do with me. I'll still 
sort of back channel with her and say, hey, by the way, when they come back to your house, they're going to want to talk about this or they might bring it up, give you a heads up. And this is what I said so that we can be on the same page. So look, I'm slightly more evolved in that sense because I've failed many, many times, you know, just like, you, you, again, your frustrations, like she made a decision that you didn't agree with. And just, that was the final decision that's happened to me many, many times. I'm sure it's happened to my ex many, many times, but now I'm at a point where, again, hopefully what people will learn from this is that you got a back channel with your ex when you're talking about the kids and, but and I that's do that. sort of where you got to look at it. I, I do that almost in everything. I thought in this case, and again, I, I see your point and maybe, I could have gone about this a different way. I did not expect it to end the way that it did. And what I want to do is empower the kids to feel comfortable talking to both of us about issues. They seem to always go to her when it comes to like comfort things. Max is like afraid to talk to me about things, but they never have these kind of philosophical conversations with her. They never did before, but that was always when we were a unit. I was the one who handled sort of the heavy minded stuff and she was the one who handled the logistical stuff. But now, now we both have to handle both. And, and I'm trying to get them to come to me for more logistical things. And I'm trying to get them to open their mouths to her and not need me to say, oh, by the way, Max was really upset. How many times a week do I get the, Max was really upset. And my response has always been, I appreciate you letting me know, but I don't want to hear it from you. I want to hear it from Max. Tell him to talk to me. And in this case, that's why I did that. Because I'm tired of getting the, Max doesn't want to stand for the national anthem. I told him to talk to you, but, and I get your point. It would have given her a heads up. That could have opened the dialogue between the two of us. I absolutely understand that. But what I'll say is that how does that empower the kids to speak up to both of us and to keep us both on that same even level? I, I, and, and, and that's what I was trying to, it was, it, was, it was for a reason. I wasn't trying to exclude her. I was in fact trying to keep her on the same level with them as I was at that. Yeah, and I, and I think, look, the idea is, of course, we want we don't want our kids to be soft, right? Like we want them to be worldly. We want them to be involved in current events. We want them to understand what's going on. We want them to be able to interact with with both of their parents. What happens in these situations is that, and it's happened to me, it's happened to my ex, that you feel like just because you are a single parent does not mean you're doing it alone. You have you still have a par a parenting partner, and what happens is sometimes you think because you were mentioning that you were better at, you know, or you were the go-to person when you guys were married on some right. things and she was a go-to person on other things. What you do is because you have guilt or bad feelings about the fact that you've, you know, in some way broken up this family that you overcompensate. You do it, she does it, I do it, my ex does it. Everyone who's listening overcompensates. Like that's a that's a natural reaction to trying to be there for your kids and trying to be the best parent you can. Even if you weren't such a great parent before, you're gonna be a better parent now because you're more focused on the kids. And what ends up happening is you sometimes will just overstep your bounds. That even though there should be decisions that are made together, you're not together with your ex anymore. So you do need to make an effort to reach out to them. You do need to make an effort to respond to them on text. And by the way, I'm terrible at texting. Like when it comes to my ex, like she'll text me 10 different things. And sometimes I just don't respond as quickly as she wants me to respond. And I'm not doing it in spite. I just prioritize things. I'm like, well, I'm dealing with the kids right now. I can't respond to her because I'm focused on the kids. And you make choices. And I think at the end of the day though, what you really need to be focused on is you don't have to be the only parent. They don't need two parents who do it all. You still need to act as a team. You need to be on the same page. And that just takes time. And, and, and I think to end this part of it is, you know, this is a situation where what, what happened happened. You didn't have to agree with it, but you should still, right. re you don't have to wait for her to reach out to you. You can reach out to her and say, look, this is what I said to the kids. This is what you said to the kids. And that was kind of final. And I would appreciate moving forward if we can have a conversation before you make a final decision for our kids. And I think if you can have a conversation like that, things just get more smooth for everyone. That was one of those pick your battle situations and it happened the same week as all the stuff that we had previously discussed. So I thought I'm not going to pile on on this um, if it comes up again. And I, I honestly, I haven't really talked to the kids since they've been back into school about what they've done. Um, and maybe that's better. Maybe just let them deal with it. And if, and if the guidance counselor or a teacher reaches out to us, I'll be like, Hey, you know, did you ask the kid why they did it? We're going to go on to something fun, but let me just kind of box this whole thing in. 
I have felt, and maybe this was your intention all the time with this site, that you are guruing me. Like I'm coming to you with issues and you're like, well, you got to do that. You got it. Even your tone, it's very like shaman-like right now. You're like, you must focus on the children. <laughs> it's the children. Oh my God. I feel like I'm the worst dad ever. And you're like, you know, King dad. Should we give you that title? Like, I mean, what is this? This no. is ridiculous. All no. Right. No, exactly. We're going to move on to some, we're going we're gonna to move on to some fun stuff. And one of them is, uh, as, as I'll admit, online dating. It's fun for a lot of reasons, but really for me, and people laugh when I say this, but um, when I was going through some really tough times, people said you should start, you know, dating online. And I said, absolutely not. I'm, I'm just not doing that. Um, and they said, no, you'd be interested to see what happens. And I said, okay, fine. Great. It's amazing. My brain is exploding. And not only has it exploded because of people I can meet, like, hey, wow, super hot moms in New Jersey want to hang out with me. Like, that's fun. I enjoy that. Um, it has also been amazing for the really terrible profiles that you see, the really just genuinely stupid things that people like to put on their profiles. And so I want to share two of them. And I want to ask you, these are real profiles one that I saw in my feed and one that someone close to me saw in her feed. And I want to share both. But before that, I have perhaps the funniest uh, typo that I've seen. Now, for people who are, who are just listening to this, if you go to divorcedadplaybook.com, you go to our YouTube page, you can watch us. You can see all the looks I'm getting from Scott this entire show. about like, oh my God, the eye rolls. It's, I don't know how do you have eyes still. They're just in the back of your head. Uh, but, but also you can see at this point in the show, you'll be able to see this. Maybe at some point we'll, when we start getting more of these, we'll clip these up into little separate segments because uh, it'll be fun. And again, if you have, not if, when you come across a really, really terrible profile, dan at divorcedadplaybook.com. If we pick yours for the show, I will personally send you something. A sticker, uh, crisp high five, as people say. I will give you something. But let's go to the first one. And this is a really, really unfortunate typo. We'll see. Can you see this? Are you seeing this right now, Scott? Yeah. This is uh, a Bumble one. And we're covering the names up a little bit. We'll say K. You can see part of, the, part of his name there. I'm a single yeah. man looking for a nice, good-hearted woman that knows how to cheat a man like, like, like to for romantic walks, movies, dinner shows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have to know how to cook, treat. clean, and be supportive. I believe he meant how to treat a man, not treat. how to cheat a man. Yes. That yes. is just an unfortunate. So, that's so spell check so matters, you, people. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you're gonna bother going on a dating site, you should probably like reread your profile before you actually post it. I've had people put their spell their names wrong. Yeah, that's like, embarrassing. I mean, well, it's, it tells you about the person a little bit, I guess. I mean, he's got a sweet ass bow tie, though. He does, yeah. But anyway, he's looking for somebody who can cheat a man right. <laughs> and so, if you're if you're into that. <laughs> Go on to Bumble. This one is one that I got. Um, there's a nice picture. Uh, no. There's a cat in the background, so I'm out. But nonetheless, you know, right. everything's good. As you see on there, I don't know if you can see this, but soccer is illuminated. If you go on to Tinder now, they allow you to pick up to five different things that interest you. And then if there's people who have those similar interests, they'll show you that. And then, you know, they want to try and match people better. It's just a gimmick. They're trying to, you know, get market share back because everybody else is showing up. Okay, yeah. this was great. Then I scrolled down and read the profile. Now I'll read this yeah. one out loud to you as well. This is gonna take a bit. Five one Mexicana, RGV to Vegas to OC. I'm gonna take a deep breath before I start this one. You're prob gay if you have a pic with a mask on or if your pics are filtered. Smiley face. I wear many hats, exclamation point. I work remotely, so thanks to my job, I can travel a lot, heart emoji. I speak Spanish, smiley face. I'm definitely not a feminist that thinks she's better than you, no punctuation. I recently got into crypto and stocks, so that's cool, again, no punctuation. If your profile says F Trump or quote, I hate Trump, Trump, you're a pansy that lets your feeling, that lets your emotions, excuse me, rule you. You're a pansy that lets your emotions rule you. Facts don't care about your feelings. No, I don't support BLM. Again, this is a dating profile. This isn't 
politico and you're a commenter in the, in the section. Now, again, if you, people want to be clear. I have seen many Trump supporters swipe left. I have seen many people identify as both very liberal and very conservative because they want like-minded people. They don't want to waste their time with someone who thinks otherwise than them. This feels a little over the top. <laughs> I mean, look, dating on apps is, you know, everyone's got a platform. And so it allows them to be their true selves. And I would imagine uh, that you're not going to go out with this woman. <laughs> you know the expression, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Well, if being a pansy is wrong, then I'm a flipping pansy. Now, is that better? That's one that I saw in my feed. Is that better or worse than this, which was sent to me uh, unsolicited, thank you. Uh, this is D, don't worry about what the rest of that says, 36 years old, recently active. This again, uh, Tinder. I don't know if you can see that, it's a little pixelated. Hope you've got a big trunk, because I'm going to put my bike in it. <laughs> it's a joke. Like, 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 I'm looking, it, it, for those of you that are listening, you'd have to see the picture of this guy. It's got to be a joke. Like, like, I'm sure somebody would just mess you around and put on a profile. You know, you can do these things for free on whatever, I don't know what this is on maybe Tinder. Uh, you do it for free sometimes. It's got to be a joke. Like, that's just ridiculous. Whoever would say that, if, for the women out there that are listening, please don't date guys that say shit like that. <laughs> but I mean, so, so, so again, Dan at divorcedadplaybook.com, if you get ones, there are ones worse than that. That's just this week. That is literally just the last two days. I didn't even want to scroll back into my other screen caps too far because I just had so many good ones. And we'll keep sharing ours because again, this is the fun part of dating online. Scott, this is the part that I really prefer I sit here and I scroll through and I'm like, oh, capture, send to you, capture, send up. I've actually developed good friendships with women I've met online because all we do, not all we do, but a lot of what we do is send each other the horrifying profiles that come into our feed. And it, it's, it's a window into the human condition. And it's, it's fascinating. And yes, the guy's picture is very, he's got a beard, he's got glasses, he's very sort of, uh, looks like he's trying to be funny. Jolly. Yeah, I know, but that one's a little, that's the, if that's all you have in your bio. He, you should, he needs a place to store his bike. <laughs> I, I mean, shoot your shot, say. right? Shoot I mean, your shot. I mean, by the way, there's, you know, as our moms used to, as our mom used to say, there's a Hard lid for turn? every pot. That is not I'm just saying, there's I a thought. lid for every pot. You know, like maybe there's somebody out there that needs a bike stored in their trunk. I have no idea. I don't know. If it's it's not, it's not like, what I would say or... Yeah, that's not that's not my style. But hey, you know what, what makes this interesting? What makes it interesting for everyone who's out there doing this is that we don't judge. Well, I guess we did well, just judge. judge, actually. Um, you judge way more than I do. I'm doing this Look, just gotta, to judge you gotta, people. <laughs> you, 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 you got to be real, you know, and, and so if real is that, then maybe there's a person out there that wants it. I think being real, you know, you and I are both very communicative. And, you know, that's part of the theme of this, you know, this first uh, podcasts we're doing. And I think, you know, what I've seen is from my experiences that women like men who are communicative and, you know, in their profile and beyond. And if you can do that, look, your profile is not that hard. We'll help you. We'll help you oh, with yeah. this because there's a lot of things out there that you could do right or wrong that could really land you the best dates versus the worst dates or no dates. We will and have so a lot on that the site. To help. A lot on the site individual things what kind of photos you should take how you should light the photos what you should write if you want to do this and be funny with the junk in the trunk type of joke that's fine but also have other information beneath that that makes you look like a well-rounded real person um nonetheless uh i will readily admit that i am doing this just to judge people and because you know what you're putting yourself out there they don't know they're coming into my if you put yourself out there on a public forum and you allow yourself to be searched you are allowing yourself to be judged. We all get judged all the time. I would much rather people judge me, not just on how I look in a photo, but also how I can portray myself with whatever limit of characters I'm allowed to have. I try very hard to make sure that people see me as well-rounded. I put mental health issues in my profiles on these dating sites to ward off people who might get freaked out by that or to attract people who might think, oh, wow, this guy is not messing around. Like, He's, he's going to tell me what's up. And that's what I do. And I ask everyone who I hang out with, you know, are, are guys just like, how hard is this? Like, why aren't guys real? And they said, they're just not. They're, they're always scheming to try and 
you know, work an angle and they just, at least in my experience, the women I've hung out with prefer real. And that's the first lesson I think both of us agree will be uh, on, on the site and certainly on the show. If you're looking to date people, just be your damn self. Stop with the filters. Stop with the old photos. Just be who you are and be cool with that. Yeah. I, I, well said. So, so we actually agree. <laughs> Speaking of that, let's go to our last topic, which is being ghosted. And again, Dan at DivorcedDadPlaybook.com. Feel free to share your ghosted. If you want to send a video or you want to put a video uh, on Instagram and, and DM that to me, it's at Dan Levy thinks on Instagram. Uh, those are the things I think. So that's why it's that. And uh, we will put it on the show because I want to hear some funny stories. We don't have to, maybe we'll read it. If you're not, if you're not comfortable being on air, but certainly send us your worst ghosted story, Scott, because this one is peculiar. And I'll do it as quickly as possible. For several weeks, I have been going back and forth with a woman who lives in Philly. We have tried to make plans. I was driving to her uh, neighborhood to meet her at a bar two weeks ago, and her mother got sick. So we had to postpone. Then we were supposed to watch the Eagles game last weekend. And I texted her several times. She, ne she never got back to me. And I thought, all right, well, I guess that didn't work out. Two hours later, she sends me a text. What happened? I said, I thought you ghosted me. She's like, I thought you ghosted me. I never got your text. Sent her a screen capture. She's like, I'm like crying to my friend because I really wanted to hang out with you. The Eagles lost. I didn't go out with you. She's like, this is like a terrible day. We made plans for Wednesday. We talked Tuesday. We perhaps exchanged some photos to prepare for Wednesday. And the excitement level was heightened. No pun intended. And then on... Whatever. Oh boy. Don't judge me. Then on. I said I don't judge, but I judge you. Sorry. I just, you know, there keep are pictures. going. I'm an adult. It, it, at, you keep know, going. Dan at, everyone's got imagination. Dad, imagination is right now. Dot com. If you want pictures, I'll send them to you. I don't care. Just ask for it. I won't unsolicitably send anything. I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. But anyway, the point is uh, in the afternoon on Wednesday at about three o'clock, we went back and forth. Do you want me to come to you or do you want to come to me? Oh, she's going to come here. Great. Here's my address. Here's uh, the directions. I'll see you at seven. Awesome. Very excited. Seven o'clock. Doesn't show up. Hey, what's your ETA? No response. 7.30. No response. Eight o'clock. This goes on. Finally, about 8.15, 8.30, I call. Goes right to voicemail. So now I'm concerned. I'm like legitimately nervous because this woman is super excited. We were very excited to finally meet each other. We've been talking for weeks. I continued to either text or try her phone for pretty much the next 12 hours, thereabout. I mean, off and on. Just saying like, hey, if anybody's getting this, and I don't, I don't instantly think I'm getting ghosted because I think better of people. Um, and I think, oh my God, maybe something happened to her. Maybe she got in an accident or maybe something happened. And everyone I'm texting with is like, even if something happened, like she would have reached out to you by this point. This is ridiculous. It's been like six hours since she's supposed to hang out with you. Like that's just common courtesy. And I said, I'm giving her the benefit of the doubt. Then I'm thinking like, how, how guilty would you feel if someone was coming to your house and gotten a, like a fatal car accident? And so now I'm like really nervous. I literally started looking at news clippings to see if there was an accident in Fishtown or an accident on the bridge, because I thought like, I don't want to be the guy who's an asshole and who's mad about this. How dare you stand me up when like she might be in serious trouble. Then yesterday I went on to see if maybe there was another way to get to her. She unmatched me. She unmatched me. What the F? What is that? 3.30. Super excited. See you soon. And then not, how, how would this, what, what is that? It's you, it's you not noticing the red flags that were set up way before you were supposed to go on that date. Look, the reality in dating, and, and, and I get burned, I've gotten burned, I would say, by this in the past too, where I've seen red flags. And you know what? You're blinded by the light. You know, you want to believe that it's a good person. You want to believe that they're genuine. You want to believe that they're really into you as much as you're into them, potentially. And the reality is that everyone's got their own stuff going on. And, and either she was dating somebody else and like that was, you know, she was sort of like not so happy with it, but then all of a sudden he sent her flowers or whatever it may be. And she kind of like swung back the way and didn't really Look, have I'll a relationship with you. Hold on. Didn't really have a relationship with you yet. 
you hadn't seen her, correct? You're saying you hadn't seen her in person besides your potential pictures. Like you hadn't seen her in person. It, this is unfortunately the, the, the challenges with online dating is that it's really easy to become very gamified. And so people want to, and by the way, you do this a lot too. People want to feel good about themselves. So the reason why you have, you know, 10, 15, 20 people in your queue and you're conversing with all of them is because you know what? It feels pretty good when you're out there alone and you don't have your kids and, and who wants to stay at home alone, you know, watching Netflix. Like you want to find somebody who could be your person, Scott, but if you're juggling around a lot of people, I understand, but if you're juggling around a lot of people, you got to expect the unexpected. And sometimes you are going to get people who are going to send up red flags. You didn't see the red flags right away. You're talking about this right now. I would have told you from the, I'm crying to my friend because you didn't show up to the Eagles game to watch them and the Eagles lost, but she didn't really respond back to you. I would have never gone out to meet that girl. Never. I would Again. have cut my losses and I would have been like, you know what? I've got 19 other people I'm looking at. There's a better person out there. There's a red flag. I don't care if it's a small red flag. You're, you're, you only need ultimately okay. Again, one person. Eight years, eight months. I am thriving the red flags right now. The red flags are what, are what get, keep me going. Now, keep in mind, I was in media. When breaking news happens, you, it's a hustle. You, you got 20 minutes to get a story up and it's better be damn good and damn right. Or you have a day to turn around a column to convince hundreds of thousands of people that your opinion is right. There's a rush when you do that. I don't have that right now. And so the rush for me is this kind of stuff. Hey, it's 10, 15 at night. We've been talking for, I don't know, six hours online. What are you doing? And driving out into the middle of nowhere, that's the rush that I'm getting. So yeah, I knew all the red flags. Are you kidding me? That's why this was happening. The red flags are where I'm living right now. But, but then why are you questioning the ghost? <laughs> because, because to me, it's nonsensical. And again, I, I can't encapsulate every conversation we had, but why can't people be humans and be like, hey, look, it's, I'm just not feeling it or I got freaked out. But to block me, I, I, clearly she blocked me on the phone because it's going to voicemail all the time. Or she's dead and then somehow like there was like a note that said, take me off Tinder. And she's like falling down a bridge or something. Now I can joke around it because it clearly didn't happen. But it's incredibly frustrating. Not even the amount of time, but you know me. This is a puzzle and I hate unsolvable puzzles. This is gonna this is gonna ruin my brain for a week. It, oh, it ruined my brain that on. night. No, no, no. Like it's, that night. So, that night is fine. This is not Dan. No, nah, I made a bad decision you, that night. I, I, I. You made a bad decision, and and and, and at the end of the day, this shouldn't ruin. Well, after like, that, this, I, I tried to find somebody else to, and then I did that, and that was a, just a bad idea. So it went from bad experience to just really terrible experience. I was very down on myself after that. Oh, all right. Well, look. Um, turning a bad decision into a worse decision with somebody else is probably not the best thing for anybody. Um, certainly not you, uh, but, but again, you need to remember that you have no relationship with this person. You, all you've done is invested a few hours of your time texting and talking and maybe sending a few pictures to each other. You don't owe her anything. She doesn't owe you anything. And that's what you got. Like she clearly had something else going on. She clearly had a better option. There's, there's something, there's something happening there and you just gotta i'm not saying that you're not excited about these things but you just gotta have enough people that you can move on from i understand that share your ghost stories and tell us if they're worse than that we're gonna put them on the site look we're all in this together right i mean that's what we've kind of learned on this scott you and i are in this together everybody listening hopefully is in it with us uh scott at divorcedadplaybook.com dan at divorcedadplaybook.com we're gonna do this a lot Definitely weekly, maybe twice a week. We're not gonna be able to do it without a growing audience. Share it with your friends. We're just two dads, right? It's first. See you next time.